for Prevention of Progression is a new initiative that we started at Dana-Farber about a year and a half ago. Um, and the whole idea came from a very simple thing. In solid cancers, in breast cancer or in colon cancer, we're doing screening all the time for our patients. So when I'm age 40, I go for my mammogram or colonoscopy when we're a little bit older. And if you see a small little polyp or if you see something in your um, mammogram, usually we have things removed immediately and we don't say well why don't you wait until you have lesions in your bone or you have metastasis of breast cancer and then I'll treat you. Yet for blood cancer we see every single day a patient with MGUS or a patient which is monoclonal gamopsy of undetermined significance or a patient with an early MDS and we tell them oh wait until you have myeloma, wait until you have leukemia and then I'll treat you. And that whole idea of watch and wait is something that we've inherited, we've all been taught this way and it made sense probably in the older days when we had no treatment, we had no effective therapy, and the treatment was actually very harmful. So if you're asymptomatic and you're doing well, it makes sense not to treat you. But these days, with us understanding all the mechanisms of clonal evolution, of the tumor cells are not sitting as, you know, things that are not acquiring new mutations as we leave them alone. And as we understand better the immune microenvironment, that as the tumor cells grow more and more, they're able to make your immune system worse and worse. And as we understand all of this, it doesn't make sense for us anymore to say, well, why don't we just watch and wait until you have a full-blown disease, until you have metastatic myeloma, and then I'll treat you. And that whole concept is, is something that we need to change in our mind as physicians, we need to change for our patients, but start to prove it also clinically. We cannot say, yes, it doesn't make sense. We have to actually truly prove that early treatment makes a difference in the survival of patients with myeloma. And if we prove that, then suddenly we're changing everything. We're changing the way we think of our asymptomatic patients walking around. But you can also think that 3% of the population over the age of 50 has MGUS, and that's a huge number of people that we're not screening for, we're not looking for them. And if we know that we can make a difference in their life, we should be starting to look for them and screen them. And instead of just doing a mammogram or a colonoscopy or even checking your cholesterol level and making sure you don't get a heart attack and you die from it, we want to make sure you don't have MGUS and you will develop myeloma in 20 years from now and I can prevent myeloma. And the whole idea of prevention that myeloma will happen is such an interesting concept, right? That we can think of preventing heart attacks these days because we're very good at it and just giving an aspirin and controlling your cholesterol. It could be as simple as that in the future for us in myeloma. But we just need to make the steps. We understand the biology, we understand who will progress and who will not because we don't want to treat everyone. We cannot treat the whole population to prevent 10,000 cases or 15,000 cases. And we need to develop the right trials for the right patients, something that's not toxic, that's not forever. We don't want to treat patients forever to prevent one case. We want to truly have more of a surgical intervention just like we do in breast cancer, but in this way it's a medical but very concise and very um, non-toxic therapeutic intervention for those patients. It's a small thing that we started saying, what can we do to make a difference? So we started creating a website, creating the database that patients will enter their information in. Can we have things simple so that it empowers patients? So we started the whole initiative of pCrowd. And pCrowd came with the idea that it's a precursor crowdsourcing, but instead of crowdsourcing for funding, we're crowdsourcing for patients to give their information and to be part of this, that initiative. And it came again from the idea that patients are truly the best empowerment for moving research forward. They can truly drive the idea of collecting samples, giving information, but also can drive the research. They can really make a difference in this. And instead of depending only on academic centers or physicians or having the middleman, which is the physicians, and I can't complain about physicians, but we're truly sometimes hindering research rather than helping it when we're in the middle of something that the patients can do themselves. Indeed, if you go to the patients and ask them to be part of it, they are there to help and they were willing to help. So the nice thing about Peak Crowd is this is not something that's limited only to Dana-Farber or to the Boston area. In fact, we have it now nationally open and we're thinking very soon it will be internationally. Everyone can participate in Peak Crowd. It's really for every patient uh, and for every individual who really wants to be part of this crowdsourcing uh, way. And here we're doing not only on the bone marrow cells, so the tumor cells, we do something called sequencing. You can do epigenetics. We're leaving some 
some of the samples for the future because five years from now the technology that we have now will be archaic and we know that we will have better ideas so we want to make sure that this is going on for the next years to come so that we can have a rich environment for science. We're also looking at the microenvironmental cells, meaning immune cell regulation, stromal cells, other things. We're up to the point of now something called single cell sequencing. You can take a single cell at a time and sequence it and get the information about it uh, and whether that you know, interacts with the tumor cell and how does it do that. Then we look at the blood because the blood is a great source of what's going on in the bone marrow and it's an easier source than getting a bone marrow biopsy. So we're trying to look at uh, circulating free DNA, which is just DNA that your tumor cells um, will uh, release in the blood and we can actually measure that and sequence that so that we don't have to go back to the bone marrow biopsy all the time. And can we use that as a marker of prognosis or not in the patients? We also look at small little things called exosomes, which are also released from the tumor cells or the microenvironmental cells and their content, their RNA or microRNA or genomic DNA content. And with all of that, including circulating tumor cells, which are the cancer cells just going around in the blood, we can capture them and get information about them. So the blood is the rich source for us to get all this information and it's easy for the patients to give it and we can track it over time so it makes it much easier for us to say every six months what's going on with this patient and if we see molecular markers of progression we can develop them to say these patients if they have those markers they will go on to develop myeloma in five years we should be careful with those patients while others they don't need to worry about this. It's not going to be a big problem for them. Then the next questions will be therapy. So we're, we're talking to a lot of pharmaceutical companies as well as foundations to have sort of an umbrella of therapeutic interventions that we can think of and that are available now. We don't want to wait um, five years from now. It's, uh, you know, it, the fierce urgency of now is very important for us. Um, so we have the, and again, with so one thing in mind is we want to make sure that these are not toxic therapeutic interventions. We will not cause damage of stem cells 10 years from now. So immune therapy and vaccine therapy is the first thing we thought of, and there is already a vaccine trial that's ongoing. We're developing other vaccine trials. We're talking about immune therapy with antibodies, ilutuzumab, deratumumab, uh, PD-1, all of the immune checkpoint inhibitors because you harness the immune system so that it can really kill the tumor cells, and that's very important. And then we're starting to also look at the new things that are coming out and whether these will be useful for us or not. And then, of course, oral therapy because it's easy and well tolerated. And with all of these in mind, we want to make sure the therapy is only limited. It's not forever. It's either six months, it's eight doses, it's whatever it is that we can kill the tumor clone and not cause resistance or cause long-term damage. And then we will still follow all the patients and ask the questions, did we do good or not? Did we change the survival or not? Did we kill all the tumor cells or we left some behind? And why did we leave them behind? Are they acquiring resistance? Are they going to cause more damage in the future or not? These are all very important questions so that we don't come back in a year or two from now and have the same problems. And we learn from our own experiments as we go on. And we know now that prevention makes a big difference for, for many diseases. In fact, um, probably one of the best things we should be doing is instead of therapy is really prevention, is intervening early before complications happen. And that's true for all of medicine and not just for cancer therapy, uh, let alone, you know, cancer therapy is much more important. You know that if you have an early tumor clone that hasn't acquired all the mutations, that hasn't changed the microenvironment around it, you know that this one likely could be cured because you can intervene early. Uh, and it could be intervening early with vaccine therapy or with changing your immune system to kill that small tumor clone. You don't have to take toxic medications. We just have to know how to treat that clone. So I think in the next two years, it will be interesting how we change completely the way we think of high-risk smoldering and maybe even earlier and earlier in the disease progression of myeloma.